how do we start moving through mathematically the process of finding what the allowed energies are for the finite square well? So in this case, I'm going to try to closely follow the notation used by the book. And it's going to be a little bit different than the last videos because I've been using a well of width L. And so one edge of that well is at negative L over two, the other edge of the well is at positive L over two. Now, in fact, you have a well of width 2a going from negative a to positive a. Again, this is a case where I think it's really valuable that you always remember what these parameters mean. So I think by switching notation, this is actually helpful so that you don't get used to thinking L, 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 L. You think, what is my width of the well? Now it's 2a. So remember before, I had negative L over 2, positive L over 2, now that's a. So another key thing to remember is that K and Q were originally defined in terms of the energies. So fundamentally, we're trying to say, what are these allowed energies? So those energies are going to be quantized. Those lead to quantized values of K and Q as well, but K and Q aren't independent parameters, right? They both depend on the same E. So we have to keep that in mind and work back to that. So finally, one thing that I did kind of two videos ago was talking about we use our boundary conditions, we have all these coefficients, but then we can rearrange, and we finally get to this relationship. And this relationship is coming from the boundary condition on the first derivative of the wave function at the edge of the well, and either edge works based on symmetry, and it's this idea that on one side you have a sine and cosine, the other side you have exponential. So when you divide the wave function, um, the derivative by the wave function, you're just left with what was in the exponent on one side, but you're actually left with then a trig function on the other. So when we talk about a transcendental equation, this is what we mean. Something that you can't just simply invert, right? I'm not giving you like a specific mathematical thing. But the idea being that we could plug in our values for k and q because they both relate to e, and e is truly what we're trying to solve for, but we actually have this incredibly complex form. Now you might know if you have a function that's like 0.1 equals sine of theta, okay, we can invert both sides, and I have the inverse sine of 0.1 equals theta. Easy. Well, the problem is here that I have k tangent equals this other thing. So this has my e in it, this has my e in it, and that also has my e in it. So my e appears everywhere, so even if I use an inverse tangent, I now have my unknown inside an inverse tangent. So a mistake that I see students make here is that they assume I can solve for my unknown. Y you can't. You just can't use the same algebra techniques that you used in intro physics. Now we have to talk about a new technique. So that's the first thing. To understand this is a really hard thing to work with, and so we have to introduce a new technique to do it. Now, one of the first things we're going to do is introduce some new parameters. There are so many letters floating around, I wrote this down ahead of time, because no, I don't remember these off the top of my head. Now, one thing to remember is that these are going to be dimensionless parameters, and that's just saying it doesn't have units. That's helpful because we want to be able to manipulate these in different ways, and if they had units, well, we would have to think more carefully about how we're manipulating them. So the first one is just relabeling z as this argument, so tangent z. And relabeling variables may or may not be helpful, but clearly z looks a lot simpler than this nonsense. But z then relates to e, again, what's going to be our allowed energies, and a bunch of stuff we know. a in this case is going to be our well width divided by 2. And this is dimensionless. And if you could say, well, how do you know that? Well, you could look at the units of each of these things. Another thing you can do is look at this. Tangent of a number, that number can't have units. It can have radians and degrees, that's okay. But you can't take tangent of two meters. You can't take tangent of two seconds. So this is a unitless number. We then create z naught. What's the difference? Well, instead of having a general value of e, this one is a specific value, which is the height of our well. So this is going to be a variable, the first one is. And we expect this to be quantized. So meaning that there's only going to be certain 
allowed values that we find. This is what we're going to look for. And then once we find our value of z, we can calculate e from it because everything else is unknown. And so in the end, this is going to end up having an index on it. So like one, two, three, four, and that's going to relate back to the energy. Now we come down here to z naught and notice that these are actually all known quantities. M would be the mass of our particle, V naught is the depth of our well, it's going to be like 2 EV or something. A is again the half width of our well, and then H bar is a, is a constant. So this is a constant, not meaning for all of time and space, every problem you'll ever see, but for this problem. This is a known value. Also unitless. How do we know? Well, the only difference between Z naught and Z is that we've plugged in a specific value for E. So if this was dimensionless, had no units, this one also must be. So one last thing to note, and, and the book is using this, and this is really important but not done so quite clearly, is that QA squared, if we write this out, remember we look back at what Q is, and when we square Q, the square root goes away, and I've now multiplied it by A squared. Okay, so I've just taken this, square root's gone away because I've squared it, multiplied by A squared, I get this. So I have this term in front, E minus V naught. Well, if we look up here, here's an E, here's a V naught, and if we square both of these, that term out front pops out. So QA squared is equivalent to Z squared minus Z naught squared. And so the point is that this now is not an independent parameter. It can be re-expressed this way. Why on earth are we trying to do this? Always an important question. So we can come over here and let's look. So, and remember that we've had two different cases because we considered our, our odd symmetry solutions and our even symmetry solutions separately. And it get, what gets really confusing is if n is odd, that's an even symmetry solution. So let's start with this one, the, the k tangent. So I can multiply both sides by a. So I get ka tangent of ka equals qa. Cool. ka is z. So I have z tangent of z equals something. I don't want that something to be anything different. I don't want to introduce more parameters. It already looked like I had two different parameters, but I didn't really because they both depended on E. So that's why we're using this relationship. Now I don't have QA squared, I have QA. So what I get here is the square root of Z squared minus Z naught squared. You might look at this and say, how on earth is this better? It's a technique. Again, the challenge is up here, you would have actually needed to plug in um, these two definitions and that would have looked a little bit messier. And really our goal at the end of the day is, is to get to E. So if you find a way that you can plug this in and then use a technique to get to the values of E, that's not necessarily wrong. There's a lot of different numbers to plug in here and you have to have the units work out. So you have to really say, well, what are my units of mass here? Kilograms? Okay, sure. What are my units of energy? EV? Okay. What's my length? Nanometers. Okay. Your numerical value is not going to work out. So you have to be very, very careful with units, which is why using this technique and then just needing to do one calculation at the end is, is kind of nice. I've been surprised in that there's a homework problem where you actually calculate specific values of energy. And I think there was one year that not a single student got it right. Really, all you had to do was plug in numbers, but simply because of all of the possible choices of units, it was really hard to get to the right answer. So we're now to this form, and we're looking for z. Again, this is just going to be a known value. So what on earth do we do about this? Well, this is going to be an issue. Did I make a mistake on this one? No, that's fine. It, it can go... Uh, I'm looking at this just checking my signs and I'm worried that I made a, a sign mistake. Yes, I've made a sign mistake here. Sorry. So going back really quickly because I'm not re-recording the video. There's a sign mistake. It should have been V naught minus E sub N, which would have uh, swapped the indices here. And you would have figured that out if you tried to subtract and take the square root of numbers that are not opposite. So then that happens. This is much better. Okay, so now it's z naught squared minus z. 
So that, that sign matters. Okay. So now what do we do? Well, we're trying to find this value of z. It's still a transcendental equation, so there's a few techniques that we can use. Maybe you have a calculator that will in fact do this for you. Um, you would, for instance, put in a, you can get like a specific value of, of um, z naught. Like maybe, maybe your calculator will do this for you. Maybe you can use mathematical tools. I will go through a, in the next video, based on how long this one is, a graphical technique that we use that I really recommend, but it takes a little bit to understand uh, what's happening.